You know what I often ask myself, and gosh, I'm so imperfect at all this, uh, Sharon, I, I'm embarrassed sometimes, but I'll ask myself, well, you know, as I confront a moral dilemma or, you mm -hmm. know, difficult situation in the community, I'd say, I'll say to myself, hmm, what would a Buddha do? Mm -hmm. You know, instead of what would I do? <laughs> right. <laughs> because <laughs> inevitably I'll stir up something. <laughs> but what would a Buddha do? Hello, hello, and welcome to the Meta Hour podcast with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Lily Cushman. I produce this podcast. Today we're coming to you with episode 230 and the return of the amazing, inspiring, illuminating Roshi Joan Halifax. Roshi is a Buddhist teacher. She's the founder and head teacher at Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She's got a brand new offering available, which is a card deck from Shambhala Publications, In a Moment, In a Breath. And Sharon and Roshi are lifelong friends. This conversation truly feels like sitting in on two friends having lunch together. And the center of the conversation are the themes from Roshi's new card deck. And these are oriented to the five elements. And so this is a really lovely conversation that slides in and out of different teachings, such as getting grounded in the body, equanimity as inclusiveness, the strong back, soft front, also radical inclusion, and how all of these different topics are linked to fire, water, earth, air, etc., etc. There's also some history here about how Roshi came to the path, as well as some reflections about our beloved Ram Dass in the latter years of his life. So you're in for a wonderful conversation. And before we get to today's episode, a quick announcement. We recently launched a new website for Sharon. It lives at the same place at SharonSalzberg.com. And there you can find all of the Sharon archives the 230 podcast episodes, a lot of her old articles and press, as well as several years of On Being columns, and also an online store that houses a variety of guided meditations, courses, and classes. So you can spend some time over there and dive into the world of Sharon. And also, we do sell gift certificates for the online store. If you ever want to introduce someone to Sharon, that's a great way to do it. And you can also find the full catalog of all of Sharon's book offerings there, including Finding Your Way, the most recent illustrated gift book. So let's head into today's episode, Sharon Salzberg and Roshi Joan Halifax. Hello, dear Roshi. It's so nice to have this time with you today. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Sharon. I'm so happy, first of all, to be with you. And second of all, you know, um, we're, we're at a stage in life where our most precious friendships become even more precious to us. That's and really I true. miss seeing you in person. But this is a good second string, so to speak. Yeah, well, I miss you too, and it's kind of current conditions. So, um, where are you now? Are you up in your refuge? Yeah, I'm up in this beautiful valley at nine thousand four hundred feet altitude, and it's a hidden valley. It's a Beul. It's a kind of little treasure valley high up in the Sangre de Cristos that's very hard to access. I'm coming down today. Hopefully the river isn't completely frozen over because you have to ford a river. Oh, gosh. To get up here. <laughs> I know. What do you do if it's frozen? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, we're we're in Wendy's new truck. It's very heavy. So if we break through, that might be a good thing. And in fact, uh, breaking through is sometimes a really, you know, um, very positive experience. So I'm hoping at the Ford, if we don't just float over the ice, we break through and then climb out. <laughs> Does this mean that you don't go up again in the winter or you you do? I, you know, um, I, I am determined to return, but mm-hmm. uh, I think I'm aging out in terms of snowshoeing up here. <laughs> breaking oh, yeah. Trail. yeah. I have a feeling I've, I've uh, completed that cycle, but you know, one never knows. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I might not be up here <laughs> until next April or May because. This, yeah. I hope you get up there because uh, yeah. I know how much it means to you, but. Nonetheless, I'm sure you carry it in your heart. And it's true. It's true. The wiles. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a good good situation. Um, it really, during the pandemic, which is when I uh, crafted all those micro meditations that are in the, mm-hmm. this wonderful uh, card deck that Shambhala produced in a moment, in a breath. You know, so I was up here during most of the pandemic. And um, I realized, you know, as I was doing daily chores in order to survive up here and moving about, um, that having these flashes of meditation, these micro practices, it was really important. Um, It was just a a way to um, bring one back home, to uh, get grounded, to remember uh, one's intention and one's mm-hmm. aspiration. So it was up here that I, I wrote that uh, series of practices. And by the way, uh, you're the one who started me on this path. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't start you on your path altogether because uh, when we met Logos many years ago, you were already a practitioner, no doubt. You know, So actually, maybe why don't we start there? You can Talk a little bit about how you came into the world of meditation. Well, I probably like you and Jack and Joseph and others in our kind of age range. Um, uh, But you all went in a slightly different direction, uh, um, though meditation was the great ballast for all of us. And for me, it was because I was a social activist in the 60s. And in relation to the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And I was just tied up in a knot, you know, very uh, critical of our government, uh, you know, full of uh, opinions and so forth. All of them, I feel, in retrospect, were absolutely right, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in any case, um, I encountered Thich Nhat Hanh. Because I was in New York, I was at Columbia in the Bureau of Applied Social Research. And I, you know, I had this natural penchant toward contemplative practice. But I had the wrong idea about contemplative practice. I thought it was just that. And when I encountered Thai, I realized that um, being a social activist and environmental activist plus being a contemplative, um, this was a path. And it was a path that uh, changed my life, made my life uh, stronger and healthier, more resilient. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as I'm in the ninth decade, um, more joyful, even in the midst of all of the sorrows of this world, Mm -hmm. of being able to, you know, uphold myself, um, to meet, the conditions that we find ourselves in locally and globally. And you know what, Sharon, I I say often now, um, I feel I was born for these times. Mm -hmm. It's such an interesting uh, phrase and such an interesting perspective because um, there's clearly, you know, a lot of uh, hatred and discord and unrest and upheaval and, uh, to some extent, I'm sure there always is, you know, depending on one's own circumstances. But uh, sometimes it just seems like we hit a theme, you know, and yeah. uh, kind of collectively. And 
here we are. So it's also an interesting time to come out with something like this uh, deck of cards. And I want to go into it in much more detail because, you know, when I first started meditation practice, uh, there was one form. I was in India. It was intensive retreat. And whether you were, uh, say, I was a Goenka student in the very beginning of my practice, that meant an intensive 10-day retreat with a beginning and an end and kind of a formula to it. Or if you were just working with a teacher um, as a layperson, as a non-monastic, you know, which is a whole other way of life as practice, um, you were on retreat. And the idea of, well, even there were so few books in English or uh, the internet didn't exist, you know, because I'm that old. And, uh, you know, you weren't listening to a podcast. You weren't using an app, for God knows. Uh, you weren't even taking a class as compared to a retreat. And so it's sort of an amazing moment in time to see all these many, many forms in which people can either begin a practice or be encouraged to bring a practice into their life. and here you are with a curated set of meditations in a deck of cards. Well, you know, there are a couple of things that stand out for me. One is that, uh, first of all, I have to acknowledge you one more time, if not <laughs> more often, because when we met in the early 70s and you shared with me your practice of the Brahma Viharas, I was like, you got to be kidding. Um, as you know, <laughs> I was like, you know, I was a Zen being and uh, I was more of a book Buddhist. But then, you know, you read these books and you realize, oh, yeah, Zen. So um, uh, you said to me, and, and I've shared this before in our interactions, you said mm -hmm. this will change your life. And I thought, well, gosh, I, you know, I got into meditation. That changed my life. Now something else to change my life. <laughs> and it did. Mm -hmm. And that was a fascinating experience that from the ground of the cultivation of attentional balance and, and then shikantaza or open presence or choiceless mm -hmm. awareness, um, at the same time, cultivating um, you know, what we in, in the Mahayana Buddhist world call bodhicitta, this deep aspiration to awaken in order to, to benefit others. And then really um, dropping into the qualities of mind and, that um, give rise to this aspiration that is basic compassion and altruism. And it was, and I was working with dying people at the time, as you know, um, with Stan, and it it changed my life, Sharon. And although, um, you know, for the most part, Zen does not engage in so-called guided practices, mm -hmm. I, you know, I teach them. Um, you know, again, credit to you, uh, learning from you how to do this. But then during the pandemic, um, uh, in interviews with people all over the world, mm -hmm. um, I realized that people's uh, capacity to really uh, concentrate, to be present, was undermined by fear. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, dropping into a long, uh, deep, winding practice an unwinding practice was not congenial for many people who were so uh, fragile and upregulated, so threatened. But also, um, I had this experience uh, myself. You know, I'm up here in the mountains, but I'm doing whatever I can to, you know, be of support to the Zen Center, to Upaya. Mm -hmm. And I just realized I needed these kind of flashes these micro moments, which brought me back into the present moment uh, in a way that was grounding and also liberating. So, um, you know, I began to write down these little micro practices. Mm -hmm. And I had done some of this, you know, again, thanks to you in, in care of the dying in that work. But it, you know, it really began to grow and expand. And, you know, as I was up here, um, I 
you know, I would be running tests on myself, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you know, keeping the language really simple and direct, going to, to essence, and yet um, providing a kind of range or suite of practices that can be brought forward in many different kinds of situations. I'm so glad you said that because it's a, a great point that something like um, this form, like the deck of cards, isn't really only for beginners. You know, it's not only a way to start. It's not only a great entryway. Uh, but those reminders are so precious. It's like, um, so, you know, something I've often said is that mindfulness is not hard to do. It's awfully hard to remember. <laughs> you know, or like, you know, think about um, Thai Thich Nhat Hanh's suggestion that you not pick up the phone on the first ring, you let it ring three times and breathe. And like, who's going to remember that, you know, or, <laughs> you know, unless you have like a, a something that is going to just kind of have you pause for a moment and say, Oh, right. So uh, the cards are organized by elements and also the five Buddha families. So it's earth, water, fire, air, and space. And uh, maybe we can look at each of these themes a bit. Um, which will bring in the whole world. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the first is earth, which is grounding, which is such a good starting point, coming into the body, finding the breath. And I know that also figures strongly in your work with caregivers. Yeah. Yeah, the body is such a powerful repository of information that is pre-conscious. And it, if we take that pause that you just referred to and notice what's happening in the body. We can not only get grounded, but meet the world in a more resourced way. And this is one of the things that, as you mentioned, um, we share this so often with um, people who are doctors and nurses, because in a way, the training for clinicians, these two categories of clinicians, is very disembodied. And mm-hmm. often uh, the first thing that one does is, you know, take one's awareness to the patient completely and um, with all of the filters, algorithms, biases <laughs> unaccessible to us and uh, not fully aware of what the body is telling us about this individual or our experience of the encounter with this individual. So, you know, it could be super positive or it could be feeling very toxic or threatened and so forth. So really beginning with the earth, grounding, but also um, developing this capacity to sense into what the body is telling us. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I found those instructions, especially in the beginning of first hearing them, uh, sounded too simplistic to me. Yeah. <laughs> and of course they work, which is the whole point. And they're powerful. And why not have something too elaborate and too inaccessible? That's that's the whole reason to have them is that they're accessible uh, and present. But it's hard to sort of get that simple sometimes. Well, the, the Buddha kind of had it, you know, a good idea in terms yeah. of the four foundations of mindfulness, the first being the body. And I, you know, I thought, yeah, that's, that's right. That was a really good insight. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, the other thing, Sharon, for me is simple is hardly bad, as yeah. you well know. Um, uh, doing the, the most simple thing, which you and I both teach and that is bringing attention to the breath, breath in the body, being with the details of the sensation, as you know, as a way that body and mind are sewn together through concentration, through stability, through presence, through connection with this very uh, essential somatic experience, without which we for sure would be dead. Mm-hmm. For sure. <laughs> I'm also thinking of somebody told me that in some medical schools, uh, physicians are taught to use the touch of um, 
we don't have doorknobs anymore, but like a door when you're opening it, right? whatever you're pressing, uh, you know, to use that touch as the reminder to stop ruminating about the last patient mm -hmm. that you saw and open to the person you're about to see. Yeah. Uh, so those very simple techniques really can be very effective. And another one that uh, doctors and nurses are using now is, you know, using the experience of washing the hands mm -hmm. um, as, you know, a, a physical gesture that points toward a metaphorical, uh, the metaphor of, you know, being open and clean to receive the new <laughs> encounter or letting go of the old encounter. Mm-hmm. You know, you've worked in um, uh, your years of, of uh, encountering people in the, the field of service to others, you know, with women who are working inside of uh, shelters mm -hmm. where abused women take refuge. I'd love you to say something about that. Well, actually, uh, uh, that brings to mind... Um the next element of water and both your work and the experiences that I had uh, working with so-called caregivers. And the next element is water and it's related to living your vow, uh, which feels to me like an invitation to bring our values to life, yeah. to life in alignment with what's essential to us and the qualities we wish to live by. And it was in the context of a presentation you were um, offering that I first heard the term moral injury. Mm. And, yeah. uh, you know, to understand that so many people in these places or even working at home, taking care of someone at home, you know, who's ill, or you're dealing with a seemingly intractable system often and things you're asked to do or compromise or overlook or uh, is very tricky in so many levels. and. Um, to remember, you know, your initial motivation to see if you can stay in touch with that, to have a community that can help you realize you're not so alone in what can sometimes feel like a struggle to align what you really care about and what the world is offering. And all of that, I think your work has been uh, so amazing in that way. And uh, it's kind of the next step, I think, after grounding. Uh, for many people, and uh, it's something I really had to keep remembering, you know, in my own work. Well, it, it's something I think we all have to keep remembering. You know, when I was working on um, the, this, uh, these geographies of practice, Sharon, mm -hmm. um, in a certain way, I uh, used uh, the GRACE model, you know, this mm -hmm. beautiful intervention. So the G of grace is gathering your attention. So that's the grounding and uh, so forth. And the R is recalling your intention. Mm -hmm. So here we have this, uh, this um, uh, view of uh, a kind of call to action, which is to uh, live by our vows which of course our vows are not just about protecting our own mind, but about being good and kind in the world, protecting uh, our world, our environment, uh, societies, and so forth. And so the way we express our vows is you know, through the medium of compassion. So in this particular uh, set, the water set, it really has to do with, um, uh, you know, our capacity to uh, uh, recall why we're really here, which is to end suffering, to, to mm -hmm. bring to an end the sorrows in this world. And so many people lose that thread. Um, you know, in medicine, again, because I interact with so many clinicians, um, uh, the demands of the system, the the intensity of the work, uh, the style of education before doctors and nurses even, you know, get to serve, so to speak, um, uh, is very dehumanizing for many. And um, the, the calling that brought people into medicine, nursing, uh, caregiving, 
that calling is sometimes just simply forgotten or mm-hmm. met with cynicism. And so this is, you know, a call for us to recall our intention and also to access our motivation, not a motivation that is uh, uh, self-oriented, ego-oriented, like trying to get money or power or, you know, be well-known or something, Um, but to uh, have this really deep-seated and at the pre-conscious level, a motivation that is fundamentally altruistic. And uh, that is just essential. So when I say living by vow, um, it is not only the, the vows themselves to protect the mind and protect the world, but it's also to really go deep into both our motivation and our intention in doing this practice and in how we conduct ourselves in the world. And it really is, it's relevant whatever work you might do, or if you don't work, you know, yeah. particularly it's seeing your whole life as a kind of creative medium. Because listening to you right now, I just remembered um, years and years ago, I wrote a book called Real Happiness at Work. And after that, I was doing a lot of workshops on work. And uh, I was doing one and this woman raised her hand and she was like completely radiant talking about her job. And it turned out that her job was Uh, answering customer complaints on the call-in line. And she said, I just love everybody. I can't always help them. By the time they get to me, they're totally freaked out. They've already talked to two or three people. And I can't always make it work, but I'm always honest. If I say I'll get back to you at 2 o'clock, I get back to them at 2 o'clock. I'm treating them with respect. And she was like lit up and The irony was that I had just been a complaining customer with some service, some phone service, and they treated me horribly, you know, (laughs) and I felt terrible. (laughs) And I thought, and I thought, you know, this very likely was not her dream job growing up. And yet here she was, Uh, and you may not work at all, but you know, every conversation you have with somebody, you know, every time you encounter a stranger and, or do you remember to thank people, um, can refer back to your primary intention. Exactly. I, I mean, it's not to make, um, what could I say? It's not to make this uh, sort of overwhelming and, you know, too precious, mm-hmm. the, the world of vows. But you know what I often ask myself, and gosh, I'm so imperfect at all this uh, Sharon, I, I'm embarrassed sometimes, but I'll ask myself, well, you know, as I confront a moral dilemma or, you mm-hmm. know, difficult situation in the community, I'll say, I'll say to myself, hmm, what would a Buddha do? Mm-hmm. You know, instead of what would I do? <laughs> right. Because <laughs> <laughs> inevitably I'll stir up something. <laughs> but what would a Buddha do anyway? I think it's, you know, uh, we have a, a kind of fascinating role model in in the yeah. presence of the Buddha in our lives. You know, someone who left home, who struggled a lot. And I often cite the uh, fascinating so-called fact that even as the Buddha was dying, Mara showed up. You know, mm-hmm. it's like... Or His Holiness the Dalai Lama still gets up at three in the morning to practice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it, this is an ongoing, what Dogen calls continuous practice. Mm. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the it's next not- element is uh, one of our favorite practices. It's fire, meeting the boundless heart. And that means getting in touch with the qualities of the heart like the Brahma Viharas, which you mentioned before, of loving kindness and compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity, and um, in any order, actually, <laughs> however you might approach them. Yeah, I, I love this section, and of course, you're the main inspiration for it. So again, I bow in gratitude. Well, thank you. Um, truly. Um, you know, uh, the... The benefits to um, uh, kindness and compassion are uh, so deep and so great. You know, for example, 
of course, offering kindness and compassion or feeling joy when others uh, have, you know, a great thing happen to them. Um, uh, those who receive that glance, so to speak, um, those who receive that, that uh, moment um, have, you know, immense benefit. And those who s observe um, such an encounter they also benefit. And also, um, those who engage in the Brahma Viharas, these boundless abodes, um, uh, we benefit. And so, you know, it's like a sort of triple win, so to speak, but you don't do it as a triple win. It's just, you know, at a certain point in practice, this is what naturally arises. It's completely context dependent. It's spontaneous, it's unprescribed. But one other thing I wanted to mention in relation to this series, which I probably didn't reflect in the card, but um, uh, I want to just mention it because uh, of what we're in today, which is a time of such extreme polarization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so much uh, uh, aggression and fear um, and futility. And um, I really appreciated a, the way that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has characterized the, the fourth Brahma Vihara, and, um, which, which we call equanimity. And a lot of people don't really know what that means, and mm -hmm. maybe I don't either. But in any case, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Thai uh, characterizes equanimity uh, beautifully as inclusiveness, inclusiveness. Mm. It's very interesting um, uh, angle, so to speak, because um, it means that uh, we can, in fact, um, uh, include everything into our experience. Very much, you know, this is, uh, I often share the story of when Ty came to Omega and right after Rodney King was so horribly beaten. And um, he said that he didn't even want to come to our country. But then he sh shared that he too was the policeman as mm. well as Rodney King. Mm. And that just was like, that's inclusivity. That's inclusion. That's equanimity. It's not turning away from any being or thing. Um, but to understand we inter are with all beings and things and doing, having that realization is um, characterized by the experience of equanimity. Mm -hmm. Pretty radical way to look at it. But I, uh, anyway, um, I just, I share it because uh, it's been very much on my mind recently. Uh, you know, in, in terms of what's happening in Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis Russia, boy, I sure have opinions about that. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, my God. And then, you know, Israel-Palestine and like, hello. Yeah. Um, you know, that is just bewildering and, uh, and, and horrifying. So, you know, it's holding at the same time, the truth of suffering and not turning away from the suffering on both sides of the equation of aggression, that too is suffering. Mm -hmm. That too is suffering. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard, you know, and that's why people don't do it, I'm sure, but it seems essential, and it seems essential to be voiced, even if it's unpopular in the sense that, you know, I think it's much easier for us, and including me, to uh, be positional than to really take in sort of the immensity of suffering that is more widespread than we would like to acknowledge. You know, like it's easier for us to have that sense of maybe tribalism or us versus them in any direction. Uh, and it doesn't mean, I mean, this is what's so tricky. It does not mean 
not taking a stand on things or having a sense of correct right. behavior or trying to be very active about encouraging or even enforcing correct behavior. It right. doesn't mean being passive, but within one's heart, being motivated with that knowledge that suffering is is kind of widespread here and that if we hold on to a position, it becomes like ideology. And what it's doing is it's keeping us from feeling. Exactly. And, well, of course, you know, there's also the <laughs> the experience of self-righteousness. Yeah, it's very satisfying. <laughs> I mean, it's very <laughs> satisfying. <laughs> and, and as, you know, you said, it's very tribal. So, you know, having a huge clump of individuals who are collectively self-righteous. Right. Um, moral outrage, you know, the stuff that our good friend Molly Crockett has done so much great research on. It's just like, okay, um, moral outrage ignites more moral outrage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a real aggregator, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, you know, part of it for me and uh, Sharon, it really has to do with this image of strong back, soft front, you know, of, mm -hmm developing uh, this kind of uprightness, but not stiffness mm -hmm. in the midst of conditions. And also this capacity, you know, of, of radical inclusion, of being able to include mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything into the experience of this present moment. Um, yeah, and really soften. Um, and to also have the insight to see that, you know, the people who are promulgating such horrible harm, that too is suffering. Those states of mind, those states of mind are also suffering. Mm -hmm. As Bob Thurman once said, uh, being asked, you know, why should we love our enemies? He and I co-wrote a book uh, once called Love Your Enemies, uh, which came out, I don't know, 10 or 11 years ago. And, uh, and, it was like that that's a very difficult question like why in the world would you want to love your enemies so he was defining love it doesn't mean liking and it doesn't mean approving of and it doesn't mean acceding to or submitting to yeah uh it means wishing that they could have happiness because in that genuine meaning of happiness as he put it they wouldn't be such a jerk yeah you know <laughs> well I think he said it differently but <laughs> with a little more profanity but <laughs> uh, you know, like w when we, I mean, it's, we know that, you know, from the world of trauma studies, like, you know, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And to wish people to come into a greater understanding of a connection and to understand the power of love, because that's difficult. You know, we think of it as a weakness. We think of it as being taken advantage of. Um, you know, and, and as long as, or we think of it as inaccessible to us. And as long as those things are in play, it, it's going to seem like pitiable rather than a power. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about, um, the second precept in the, uh, 10 pure mind precepts. It's the second in the five precepts too. It, um, it's about not being greedy. And one of the ways that uh, uh, Glassman Roshi, my wonderful teacher, Bernie, uh, talked about this was in relation to not cultivating a mind of poverty in yourself and others. And, um, you know, that comes back to me for to this uh, experience of radical inclusion. It's not turning away from or squeezing to death any being or thing. Um, uh, no matter how attractive or also how uh, unattractive. Um, but we're, mm -hmm. we're in a, you know, we're in a really, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I'm 81. And uh, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I was around during the 60s, and as, as were you. Uh, I think we had a more uh, idealistic prospect at that point. <laughs> And uh, here, you know, I have decided to actually not engage in prophecy or prospects, but to um, live with possibility. 
And, you know, so part of that living with possibility is the possibility of, you know, some really mean characters actually waking up mm-hmm. in, in this lifetime mm-hmm. and reversing the, the direction that we seem to be relentlessly heading in. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> and yet, and yet, you know, nihilism uh, is not the answer. No. Nope. And neither is despair, because after all, you know, these things, I mean, that's that's part of what um, has been controversial about teaching the Brahma Viharas in a way is because we don't tend to think of them as uh, trainable in a way, or things that can develop, things that can grow, and uh, it's kind of an absolute perspective. You've got it or you don't, or I've got it or I don't. Usually, don't you know? And uh, and so to understand that these qualities, um, depending on how we pay attention and learn to pay attention, uh, can ripen and and unfold and and really grow in us, and and things can look different. It's really a, a powerful vision. And, um, you know, Ty would put it, Thich Nhat Hanh put it in terms of watering the good seed, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, which I think is a re- really lovely, lovely way to, uh, to characterize this process of instead of, you know, being a toy of your mm-hmm. negativity that is, you know, psychosocially engendered, um, it's putting your hand on the tiller of openness and possibility and also of, of love for this world, including uh, the capacity to, you know, I, so I, I wrote this book, Standing at the Edge, and I included this anecdote in it. And it had to do with several vice presidents ago whom I found, you know, particularly uh, awful. Uh-huh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My opinion, oh, yeah. but um, in any case, uh, you know, I was sitting with these feelings of aversion toward this person years ago when he was in office, and um, part of this was uh, a, a thought came up for me: if I were asked to sit with him as he was dying, would mm-hmm. I? I mm-hmm. said, "Well, of course I would." Yeah. And then I, the second thought came up, which was. Can I see him as a, a, a little child, as a baby, mm-hmm. completely helpless? Of course I can. So, yeah, I don't know what happened to him, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't abandon him. And it was, you know, it's really that sensibility that uh, I think, uh, you know, when you stop and you, you look and you can ask yourself these kinds of questions, would I do that? Mm-hmm. Um, what's really important to do in these circumstances? How can I um, meet a world that is filled with really very weird people? Mm-hmm. Wow, don't they get it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I mean, just the simplest thing, that harm breeds harm. <laughs> yeah, That people suffer, that the planet is suffering. Our Earth is not suffering in the sense that we suffer probably, but it is causing this chain of suffering that uh, affects beings in every realm. Yeah. So, we're, so you know, how do you maintain um, uh, this sense of buoyancy? And, you know, um, this kind of comes to the next set, you know. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so maybe you want to talk a little bit about air. Well, no, I mean, I was thinking the same thing. I thought, wow, that brings us to the next set, you know, which is the air element uh, next on the list, being with death, which is such a potent area. And this includes working with grief and physical pain and suffering, forgiveness, and of course, letting go, which also reminds me of Ramdas. Yeah. Uh, you and Ramdas being in my, you know, friendship circle, the people I most associate with first working with dying people and really being pioneers with that. And of course, this is uh, and in fact, his network, the Be Here Now network. So uh, it just brought Rondos very strongly in, into my mind. Yeah. It, you know, in a funny way, he was the pioneer for many of us, in any case, 
both in the end of life care field and in uh, prison ministry. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he would have called it ministry, but anyway, prison work, right. you know. And um, so those were in the years of his physical robustness. And mm-hmm. then, you know, after the stroke, um, I, I mean, he was always uh, mischievous and filled with dew, D-E-W, you know, mm-hmm. s- just utter, utter brilliant sweetness. And he was so smart. But then, you know, after his stroke, he became, in a funny way, even more of who he mm-hmm. really was. Yeah. I mean, what's your, your take on, on R.D.? I think that's really true. And it, uh, it's going to move in a little bit into the next element with space and things I wanted to talk to you about. But, um, you know, I've, I had known Ram Dass. I met him in my first retreat in January of 1971 in India. And uh, he was always, uh, as everything you say, you know, and... Uh, very much the giver. He was the server. He was the one taking care of others. And it was very, very hard for him to receive, which he would admit later, you know. And, uh, you know, once after his stroke, I was in Maui in one of the retreats that uh, he was teaching. I was sitting in the back of the room, like 300 people, and he was up on the stage, you know, in a wheelchair with very a uh, halting speech at many times, depending on his level of tiredness. And um, and what he was saying was that the hardest thing of all for him after the stroke, harder than physical pain, harder than living in a wheelchair, harder than, you know, what he'd been like before the stroke in terms of speech. He had like a golden tongue, you know. He was, <laughs> you know, and then yeah. all those changes and aphasia and all that. and. And he said, harder than anything was allowing people to help him, yeah. to take care of him. And he said, uh, one of my famous books was called, How Can I Help? Now I feel like writing a book called, How Can You Help Me? <laughs> you know, and it felt to me like that was very true, you know, before and after. And it was almost like this um, barrier inside of him dissolved. And then the love could just come in and go out. And, and he was really, he was like made of love. Yeah, absolutely. And he was also made of fun. Yes, he was a lot of fun. He was really fun, I tell you. Oh my gosh! Well, I, you know, one of I, I, one of the moments with him, public moments with him, that just blew my mind was a thing that Frank Ostaseski and I were doing with him called Divine Mortality or something like that. Mm-hmm. And right before he got really sick and was in the ICU, and Frank and arrive or, or, and I arrive in Maui, and we go to the hospital, and oh my gosh, he was so uh, huge edema on his you know paralyzed side, and oh, but you know he had sparkle. Mm-hmm. But then they discharged him, so you know we all went back to the house, <laughs> and mm-hmm. Frank and I are scrambling creating a new curriculum, you know, because this was happening at Makawao Church and it sold out. And, wow, mm-hmm. what are we going to do? And Friday afternoon, when we're starting, Ram Dass says, I'm going. And I'm like, you're going? What do you mean you're going? <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> Which way are you going? <laughs> anyway, he went. And uh, yeah. we all went. And it was just mind-blowing. I remember it was raining like heck. And we, um, you know, got out of the car and pushed our way into the the uh, church. And everybody stood up. And he got pushed down the aisle. And the guys lifted him onto the stage and he he just he gave you know darshan without words for i don't know an hour and a half it was mind blowing it's just beauty emanating yeah. from him not one drop of self pity that i could perceive mm-hmm. well do you think your own work and personal experience of grief and physical pain and so on has helped your sense of fun cuz the air element is like buoyant right it is, but it, it's also, you know, the karma family. And mm-hmm. so it is It is service. You know, it's the action of service in the world. And, uh, you know, for Bernie Glassman, that was really important. Mm-hmm. And it is also about, you know, the sort of expansion, you know, in the dying process, you know, the dropping away of the dross of the body and the expansion mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. consciousness potentially in, in the experience of death. 
Um, but it's also, you know, uh, being blown hither and thither. Mm-hmm. I mean, let, let's face it. Uh, the, the journey of dying is many things to as many people. And so, so mm-hmm. I saw this photo of Hardy right before he took his last breath with his, his, uh, uh, arms, you know, the four, mm-hmm. forearms straight up and the finger pointing to space. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, woof. So this was beautiful. And, um, you know, I felt that he had done a lot in um, bringing uh, equanimity, basic, you know, uh, closure in his life and to his many relationships. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He, and he, he just, he kept things clean and current and beautiful. At least in as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's great. So let's talk about the final element, which I kind of touched on, which is space and the category coming home to wisdom. Because once I think of wisdom, I also think of boundaries. I think of limits. I think of balance. Um, and coming home to wisdom is so much about the embodiment of knowing those hard, sometimes hard-earned knowings we live through to deeply understand, like the nature of change, having a clarity of understanding, uh, you know, not having unreasonable expectations of oneself and seeing the true nature of the mind. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's beautiful how you speak to this, Sharon. And um, in the cards, there's, of course, space uh, and wisdom um, are equated, so to speak. And, and for uh, those who know the translation that Kaz Tanahashi and I did of the Heart Sutra, where emptiness is actually, uh, instead of the word emptiness for shunyata, um, we use the word boundless. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you said boundaries. Yes, in, yeah. in the relative world, um, boundaries, phenomena, particularity, individuality, and so forth exist just like every snowflake is unique as I'm sitting mm-hmm. out here looking at this snowy valley. And mm-hmm. yet they're all, all snowflakes are made of water. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, it's the interconnectedness between phenomena or the relative world and the world of the absolute or the ultimate reality or the nature of mind or the nature of reality. And so, you know, I remember Sharon when Kaz uh, shared his re-characterization of the word uh, emptiness, I was like, wow, I don't know, we're all used to um, saying emptiness. I don't Mm -hmm. know, boundlessness is going to float. But then I said, but you know what? When I'm sitting with dying people, and in my tradition, we share the Heart Sutra, and every time I say emptiness, I'm like, no, that doesn't quite, that, no, that's not the right way to say this. And I really uh, uh, opened in a, uh, such a tender, joyful way to um, how Kaz uh, was characterizing wisdom or wisdom beyond wisdom or prajna or uh, the realization not only of a boundlessness of space, but also of boundless interconnections with all beings and things. Mm-hmm. So that's you know the sort of the feeling in this final suite um, is of you know that the uh, connection between boundlessness and uh, codependent arising. Mm-hmm. Nice. <laughs> well, no, it's beautiful. Uh, and I just want to thank you for making these teachings on wisdom and compassion so available in such an accessible way. It's, it's a really great offering. It's very pretty too, by the way. Um, again, the name of the card deck is in a moment in a breath. And I'm wondering Roshi, just to end our time together this time, if you can lead us in a meditation of some kind. Oh, thank you. So, um, I just pulled the card, Ocean Mind. Mm. So I invite us uh, to begin. Let's bring our attention to uh, breath in the body. 
like waves on the ocean. The in-breath and the out-breath. And I also invite us to remember really why we're here. Not just because we turned on our computers <laughs> for this podcast, but that it is really, our lives are about ending suffering in this world, not making more suffering. See if you can affirm that. At the same time, uh, if that sense is not available to you, that also is okay. And now imagine that your mind is like the vast ocean. Waves arise and fall away. Currents play and pull on the surface. Deep down is stillness. Movement and stillness. Movement and stillness. Please rest openly in this fluid ocean mind. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everyone who's listening. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Raghu, and all of our precious Dharma friends. Really, thank you for the beautiful meditation and the beautiful card deck and all of your work. And thank you so much for being here today. Sharon, I love you. I love you too. Hey, folks. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Roshi's work, her many offerings, this new card deck, and more, you can visit joanhalifax.org. Another great resource is the Upaya Zen Center, which you can find online at upaya.org, U-P-A-Y-A dot org. And for all things Sharon, including a free guided meditation, you can head over to SharonSalzberg.com. This has been the Meta Hour podcast on the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and may you live with ease. <laughs>